Hey, Rock family. Woo, we're having church in California. Come on. I'm sure it's going to be a fun morning. You guys ready? Woo, the Holy Spirit is here. You can just feel, can you just feel the anticipation? Isn't it just great to be together? You know, I've been in, I've been in churches. I have been. Um, in Pennsylvania, I just came back from Voice of the Apostles. And uh, it was just an amazing time. I was in Oklahoma. But in California, uh, this is a first since uh, last March. So uh, I'm just so privileged to be in this house. I want to thank you, Pastor Brandon, Pastor Bob, you and I with our phone tagging. Like, when can you be here? <laughs> Bob and I are around the world in 80 days, literally. Uh, I can't. I'm, I'm in the Middle East. I can't. I'm in Brazil. I can't. I'm... So anyway, we settled on this day, which was awesome. Um, Thank you so much, Pastor Mark and Pastor Debbie. And this is my home church, my husband and I. And when I get to come to church, this is where I come. Uh, I'm usually somewhere else. But uh, when I'm in town and I'm not wiped from flying 36 hours, I slide in here. And I absolutely love it. So hi to everybody online. Um, we just bless you in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you just take over when we let you. So Lord, would you just come in the fullness of who you are and what you want to do. And God, if you don't even want to do this message, you know how I feel about that. I'm cool with it. Whatever you want to do, I just ask today, Father, that you be exalted, you be lifted up. You will be the name above every name and above every fear and above every worry and above everything that we think is a catastrophe right now. Father, you shake what needs to be shaken. So I invite you in the name of Jesus to shake off on us what needs to be shaken this morning. And the power of Jesus that reigns in us would come out in the fullness of the reflection of glory it was meant to be from the beginning. So, Lord, we love you. We exalt you. Yahweh. Name above every name. Yeshua, King of Kings. Thank you, Jesus, for your Holy Spirit. Lord, without you, we can do nothing. But with you, we get to partner with the impossible. So do that. Move the mountains this morning, God. Move the mountains in our lives and in our friends' lives online. Move the mountains in our families, God. The mountains and obstacles in finances, God, and in health. Move the mountains, God, the disunity over politics in Jesus' name. And Father, we are one bride, one unified bride, ready for her king in this time, in this hour, Lord. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Amen. Ooh, come on. All right. Listen, uh, I, um, I, I wasn't going to share this, but then Brandon talked to me upstairs. You know how that rolls? And somebody just goes, hey, I have something for you. Yes. And so I want to share a couple of things. I may not get through all the text I have for you, but today in the message, I want to talk about God is a God of honor. He is, right? And I want to talk about the weapons of warfare. Because couldn't you use a couple of new tools today? I need new tools every day. Every day that I hear the news. One of the things I need is grace. Anyone else? Yeah. Going to get a headband. Probably a mask that says that. And I'll stand and look at it in the mirror. Right? So I had been given a word from the Lord right before I left for Pennsylvania for Voice of the Apostles. And the word was aftermath. And all of you know the word aftermath is after the big devastation, the big awful, right. So it's not really, it wasn't my fun word of the day, I can tell you. Um, but what I want to tell you is God led me on a very detailed, about seven days of research about that word. And I want you to know that this is what the, the word actually means in context to what God is about to do. It means, you know, the aftermath of devastation. Okay, we got that one. We all know that one because that's what we see every day. But what you might not know, unless you're in agriculture, is it means a double crop harvest. Yes, it does, Brandon Dearborn. Look it up. Listen, it means a double crop harvest. Are you kidding me? How did they get that and then the devastate? I, what? And then I was laughing in my office. God loves to amuse me. 
as I began to research this, I realized what it means is it's an extension of the harvest season. You can actually have two crops growing on the same land. And what the Lord spoke to my heart about is the unifying of the church. We have got to stop the camps. The socioeconomic divide, the racial divide, the denominational divide, whatever the divides are that we have erected, those have to come down, everybody, because there is a harvest on our doorstep right now. We have never seen so many salvations, healings, and miracles on Zoom. What? I didn't even want to do Zoom. I've Zoomed my brains out for the last nine months. And every day I go, I'm over it. And then the Lord heals someone else or a miracle or millions of salvations. I'm like, okay, I'm good. I can do it another day. God's doing something new, everybody. He's doing something new. And the aftermath is the aftermath of this COVID epidemic interrupting divinely. (laughs) My little perfect plan. I'm like, well, when are we going to get back to normal? God. He said, I have a new normal. Would you like to join me? (sighs) Hmm. Keep that word in the back of your mind the next time you think you're limited. This morning I woke up. I didn't sleep last night. It was a strange night. And I, I actually slept for an hour from 5 to 6. My husband goes, what is the matter with you? I go, I don't know, but I didn't wake you up. And he goes, no, but you're just laying there. And I said, I'm not talking to the Lord. I wasn't just laying there. But at 6 o'clock, I, for that hour that I slept, I woke up and I went, oh. And then I just thought... I'm going to amuse myself, and then I do what I do. If you, you know, you don't, every time I come here, I say this. What's the word of the day, Holy Spirit? And the Holy Spirit said, octagon. What? And then I just had a conversation with the Lord. Do you have a conversation with the Lord? Because he's relational, and he wants to speak with you. I'm not talking, for most of you, about the audible voice of God. I'm talking about the spirit of God that lives within you, that rises up, and his word comes to life through you. And as his word comes to life, you have a revelation. Come on, I need a revelation every day. And so he says to me, you know, your your life is a circle. And then immediately I hear the Lion King. You know that song? (laughs) The Lion thing. Well, immediately. It's not that Disney impressed me or anything. So what's so weird about it is I heard that, and he goes, no, your life is a circle. You come from me, you'll come to me. And I said, yeah. He goes, but you know what? When you get bent out of shape, and you get pushed into corners, it's like an octagon. I go, hmm, I see, I'm about to get offended. <laughs> the octagon was so interesting though. He said, no, wait, 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 because these corners that you're being backed into, I didn't ask you to remain in the corners, but I'll use them. Do you know that the octagon has eight sides and eight is the new beginning? Christians understand an octagon in very, very early church, archi- the, uh, the architectural digs, these, these whole uh, discoveries. The early church was the octagon and the fish. How fascinating. And the octagon was a symbolic for the resurrection of Jesus. What a strange thing. So the Lord said all those corners are all markers. Everything that was difficult, you're either going to decide to stay in the corner or you are going to partner with my glory and speak the testimony of how you overcame the thing. And then your eight sides will join back up to the beginning in the full circle, which is your life in me. So the next time you feel like you're backed in a corner, which would be today, ask God, what are you doing in the middle of this new thing? he always, always, always is doing something good. I want to tell you, when we ended up in the middle of this, I I was in the UK in the middle of COVID, and I don't really watch the news. I have a husband who's very much uh, an engineering mind, and he loves news, so he tells me what's going on, because he knows I only like the clicks. I need a download. You know, I want to read all that stuff. So he tells me, but I was in, uh, in the UK during that time. And I really wasn't paying attention to anything. I was immersed in ministry. And within 24 hours, our borders were shut. I had to get on a flight. I had to come back home. And I had three more weeks to uh, minister in the UK. 
What was fascinating to me was I was so frustrated when I got home and I said, Lord, you know I was supposed to be in India. You know I was supposed to be in Asia. You know I, and, and the Lord's just listening to me going, wah, 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 wah. Anyone else? Yeah, oh, me. So I'm just like, I, I, like these, these, were, these are things you're doing. He goes, I can do other things. This is, bef- you know, this is days before I start the first Zoom, which I don't like that. So what's interesting about this is I, I complained and complained and complained. I know I'm not the only one in the room. I'm, I'm working on my complaining. I'm getting better. So I was complaining, and the Lord said to me, I'm going to do something significant. And within 10 weeks, we had finally birthed something that has been on my heart for three years, but I never have time to do it. We birthed a supernatural school online to study the word of God and to study how to move powerfully in evangelism. And we would have never done that if I was still traveling because I could never have enough time to record. So while everyone else was doing stuff in COVID, we were filming. And we now have four classes running online from people all over the world. We've had requests to me to have it translated in five languages. I'm going, what are you, what? And God goes, see, I'm doing a new thing. So I want you to quit balking about your old stuff. That's for four of you, the rest of you, okay? So, Lord, we just thank you for that you're the God of honor and that you do, Lord, give us the weapons of warfare. I saw on May 28th at 7.17 a.m. in the morning, I was praying, and I saw and I heard the Lord say, a spirit of defilement has come on the land. And I, I didn't really know what was going on. Uh, on May 28th, I hadn't seen any news, and my husband was in the Bay Area, so I didn't really talk to him. And I want you to note the scriptures I'm about to tell you. The Lord said to me, spirit of defilement has come upon the land causing violence against mankind, but you are not a powerless people. Do not succumb to the temptation around you to judge, criticize, and slander. I didn't know. I had no idea what was coming. He said, you must understand violence of another kind. Turn to Matthew 11, 12. Matthew 11, 12. From the time of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and violent people have been seizing it. Move to Luke 16, 16. I'm going to read the NIV. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached, and everyone is forcing his way into it. So Jesus is basically saying that to come into the kingdom requires deliberate, determined, and forceful action. We agreed on that? Yeah? So there's no contradiction between those two passages of Scripture from Luke to Matthew, because each explores Jesus' teaching from a different perspective. When we take both verses from Matthew and Luke together, we understand that the kingdom of heaven does advance into this world. It doesn't advance without conflict. Hmm. So many people hate conflict and run from it. Okay? Yeah, the most who are emphatic are nodding right now. So most of us did not necessarily sign up for advancing the kingdom with conflict. Right? When you first got saved? Okay, well, here's what we did. Jesus, please help me. Please save me. I'm a wreck. My life's a wreck. And you're looking for what? To be saved. You're looking for peace, right? In the middle of your train wreck life when you get saved. Those of us who got saved out of train wrecks. So I I don't know about you, but when I gave my life to Christ, I was in a crisis. And the last thing I wanted to do was board a battleship. I thought I was... Boarding the sailboat in the Mediterranean. I thought, this is going to be great. You know? I I seriously did not understand. But if you've been walking with the Lord, which I know most of you in this house have, for any length of time that you have figured out that your walk with Jesus doesn't actually revolve around you. That's popular. So popular. But God, but God, is so kind and patient enough to encourage us, isn't he? Every moment, as we mature in our understanding of what it means to be called and beloved. 
Whether we acknowledge it or ignore it, to belong to Jesus is to be his disciple. Say, I'm his disciple. That's right. So we are the ones who are called to advance the kingdom of heaven right here on earth. To lay hold of this kingdom and advance it through force, as Matthew eleven twelve states. But this is very far from earthly minds. Jesus Christ gave his church this body of spiritually transformed believers a responsibility to carry out. The church and every believer's mission is to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God and to what? Make disciples throughout the world, teaching them exactly what Jesus taught. You find that in Mark 16, 15, Matthew 24, 14. Jesus sent Paul, the apostle, to the people of the world. What for? What was Paul for? This very distinct mission to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in Christ. That's Acts 26, 18. When you signed up for Christianity, you became an ambassador of reconciliation. When you travel the mission field, you realize that. When you're walking around your neighborhood, you may not. Until you step out. The gospel is the reconciliation of man to God. Bringing the good news is not always the easiest thing, is it? Right? If you speak to people in church leadership who are sent to the darkest regions of the world, they will tell you it's almost easier there. John 3, 19 says this. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his work should be exposed. So listen, everybody. When we bring the light of Christ, it often causes conflict and sometimes even provokes violence in the hearts of man. Anyone? Without the Holy Spirit, you're powerless. But remember Stephen. Think about these things these days, you guys. Think about Stephen in Acts 7, 54 through 60. The word says that Stephen, the disciple full of the light of the Holy Spirit, announced heaven opening and the Son of Man standing right there. He has a revelation. He sees it all. He calls it out. And at that, the mob dragged him out of the city and stoned him to death while his face shone like the sun. Stephen never lived to see the fulfillment of the fruit born from his act of obedience, but we read about it now, don't we? Ephesians 3.20 tells us that God will do exceedingly and abundantly more than we could ever ask, imagine, or think, and he's doing it right now. And though Paul incited the brutality against Stephen, he meets Jesus on the road to Damascus and then becomes the greatest light bearer of the kingdom. Because he was called out of darkness into marvelous light and unified with the forces of heaven to raise an army. And that's what you signed up for. Obedience always bears fruit. Even when you don't see it manifested in that way. Always. We are already victorious in Christ. Because the Lord has trained our our entire body for battle. Listen to this. Listen to Psalm 144.1. Praise be to the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle. David wrote those words. And I believe David had to learn to understand war. I believe he had to learn to depend on God's plan, not his. Because what was David? A mighty warrior. But he had to learn to depend on God. Being chased, fearing for his life, he had years and years of this where he had to continue to believe God. As a warrior, I believe David was being trained by God to be like today's special forces. I do, when I read the, when I read the scriptures. He may not have been aware of it at the time, and you may not be aware of it right now. But that's what's happening. Seeing the fulfillment of the anointing of his kingship, it finally arrived 
But I don't believe for a second, everybody, that he would have been prepared for that had he not been trained up. Remember the octagon? David hit a lot of corners. And he wasn't fully shaped for the king position, the king position. God, what, what the enemy meant to destroy him, what Saul wanted to use for evil, God used it for good. And he trained David for war. He trained him in tenacity, humility, perseverance, and determination. Does that sound familiar? You know Romans 8.28. God is using this time. What the enemy wants to use to destroy you, God is training you. He's raising you up. And some of the ongoing battle training, I'm just going to give you a quick list of 10, certainly not exhaustive, but maybe something to think about. I think that one of the ways that God's training us in this season is to learn to love as Jesus did. The second thing I think he's doing is increasing our ability to hear and see what he's doing and saying. Got a whole lot more time to do that, don't you, everybody? Yeah? Number three, how to discern God's best. Not my best, not society's best, not cultural bias, but his best. Number four, I believe he's teaching me and maybe you how to walk in greater humility because if I decide or desire to rise higher, I have to learn to bow lower. Number five, he's teaching us how to live in partnership with the spirit of generosity. Because generosity leaves a legacy, everybody. Number six, it's teaching us how to operate as a person of honor despite how we are treated. Ooh, there's an open invitation for that every single day. Number seven, he's teaching us truly how to live a lifestyle of forgiveness. Number eight, he's, living, he's teaching us how to live with people in a position of peace, how to live at peace. Number nine, he's teaching us how to be people of justice without being people of judgment. And number 10, and so many of you needed it. So many leaders needed it. In this season, God is teaching us how to rest. Spurgeon wrote an amazing thing about the danger of using some spiritual weapons without adequate training. It's, it's a danger in the natural and the supernatural realm. He said this, untrained force is often an injury to the man who possesses it. And it even becomes a danger to those who are around him. And therefore, as David, the psalmist said in Psalm 144, 1, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord as much for teaching and training David as much as for strengthening him. Bless the Lord who trains our hands for war. Bless you, Lord, because you're continuing to train all your godly believers for victory already obtained by Christ. Because that is how we come into the fullness of the inheritance that is being given. There are forces of evil that continually oppose God's word. They're vastly at work. Violent men working against God, working against his church in this world at this hour. But do not be conformed by what you see on the news. Be more enthralled as a lover of God. Be transformed here by the renewing of your mind. Because I can tell you that the aftermath is here. God's matchless power is undaunted. And he is moving, and we can either lay hold of the news, or we can lay hold of him, and we can move in victory. Be unafraid of all that comes against you for the sake of my name. That's what he said in Psalm 72, 14. And then, he, then the word says, he will rescue them from oppression and violence, for precious is their blood in his sight. So I told you that that May 28th at 717, I heard a, a spirit of defilement has come upon the land. I had no idea what happened on May 25th in the George Floyd incident. So when I heard that spirit of defilement came on the land, when my husband came home, I said, did something happen this week? And he said, have you heard about the George Floyd thing? Okay, the whole thing was horrible, unnecessary, 
It was violence and rage, and, and it was horrible. It, but listen, everybody, fear and judgment will manifest the fruit of death. And that's exactly what we saw happen after that. Because pe people partnered with what was dark and not with the light. I have a young evangelist friend. He goes anywhere. The Lord sends him. He's just a wild man. And he's actually from Wisconsin. And he, wherever he was in the world, he flew to Wisconsin, went right in the middle in the thick of that stuff, and just started baptizing people. It only takes one. Reflecting the glory and the light of Christ. These words that I heard the Lord say, that spirit of defilement is here to cause violence against mankind. But you, beloved, are not a powerless people. Again, do not succumb to the temptation around you to judge, criticize, and slander. You must understand violence by the word of God. Turn to 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. I want to read the passion iteration because it speaks of something that's happening in, in the culture and should never be allowed in Christianity. Verse 3, for although we live in the natural realm, we don't wage a military campaign employing human weapons, using manipulation to achieve our aim. Instead, our spiritual weapons are energized with divine power to effectively dismantle the defenses behind which people hide. Are you hearing me? We can demolish every deceptive fantasy that opposes God and break through the every arrogant attitude that has raised up in defiance of the true knowledge of God. We capture, like prisoners of war, every thought and insist that it bow in obedience to the anointed one. Are you getting it? What is happening? It's manipulation everywhere. Do not succumb to that, beloved. We do not have to manipulate. We have the God of all eternity who is on our side. We simply need to ask him what he's doing today and partner with him in every way. So what are the weapons that he's given to us in this hour? I want you to write these down. Take notes. Reflect on these. Look them up in scripture. Let scripture be the thing that is embedded in your heart in these days, everybody, so that when you're weak, it flows out of you. It's the living water. It's the daily bread. Peace is a weapon of warfare and creates a force field against the enemy that actually allows for kingdom advancement. Peace is a weapon of warfare. Do you know that peace is a violent affront to the enemy? It renders the enemy powerless, powerless in you and powerless in the person you're reflecting that peace on. I'm not talking about manipulated peace. I'm talking authentic peace that comes out of the intimacy with Jesus Christ. We can all pretend to have peace and inside we're like a volcano. Yeah, that doesn't reflect very well. I've tried it. <laughs> As you focus and I focus on Jesus, we are in essence tearing down the strongholds of carnal thought and breaking through everything that holds us captive by laying hold of his divine power through humility. We have to be people of peace before we release peace. That's the way it works. Colossians 3.15, you know this verse, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful filled with gratitude. It's funny, if you just start thanking God for everything you have, he just keeps on giving you more and more peace. The opposite to worldly violence is peace. And Matthew 5, 9 tells us, blessed are the peacemakers, because they'll be called sons of God. The sons of God carry authentic peace. That's what you carry. The next weapon is the weapon of honor. And I believe the most powerful weapon of our warfare in advancing the kingdom on earth is the release of honor. Everything in the kingdom is based on honor, for honor comes from God and honor belongs to God. I want to 
read to you what I felt the Lord give me about honor. And I just wrote down what I heard. And this is what I heard. In the beginning, all heaven and earth was created in harmony and in order. I am honor. And therefore, the creation of all life has been given a code of honor. High respect. Privileged. Held in great esteem. Given to keep agreement. Birthed to fulfill an obligation and live as a source of distinction. Most will not think on this, but all life is created for honor. The circle of life is my creation, and it honors me. Each creature's life depends upon another and therefore honors the system I created. Did you ever think about that? Isaiah 43.20 says, The beasts of the field will glorify me. The jackals and the ostriches, because I have given waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people. For something more to blow your mind, all the galaxies, all the stars, all the universe out there is within a system of God's design. This pattern moves within itself to bring his name, honor, and glory. It's all for him. Think about the sunrise and the sunset and the patterns of the earth's orbit. His name. And his glory is all on the honor of the systems he created. It all magnifies him. Everything is built to magnify. And if you're not magnifying him, you're magnifying something else. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your own body. We are living as symbolic and actual manifestations of the honor of God for the spirit in us. When man des desired to dishonor himself in the garden and eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it was before in that moment when everything separated. So when we look at Jesus who came to us and restored everything back, he restored us to honor. It's really hard to look at yourself like that, isn't it? But when you think about it, he restored us in his righteousness, in the honor system of God. So when we choose honor as a way of life, we are reflecting his righteousness to the world. What you are witnessing and I am witnessing across this world and in the United States is dishonor, locking up hearts, and defiling minds. Dishonor is disorder. Dishonor is disorder for harmony only exists with honor as the foundation. What is the foundation of God? Honor. What's the world doing? Dishonoring everybody that disagrees with it. Violence is the fruit of a dishonorable and disordered mind. Second Peter, I'm getting close. You guys all right? Second Peter 1, 3 through 8 says this. I really want you to, to hear this. The word is so rich within, with all of these truths. Everything we could ever need for life and complete devotion to God has already been deposited to us through his divine power. For all this was lavished upon us through the rich experience of knowing him, who has called us by name and invited us to come to him through a glorious manifestation of his goodness. Verse 4, as a result of this, he has given you and me magnificent promises that are beyond all price, so that through the power of these tremendous promises, you and I can experience partnership with the divine nature by which we have escaped the corrupt desires that are of the world. The divine nature of God is the partnership we've been given in Christ. And this union is again built on the foundation of honor. Last couple things. Agape love, the unconditional love of God, 
is like an ambassador of honor, bringing peace to two oppositional dishonoring forces. Think about that. When Pastor Bob goes to a place where they don't know Jesus, or when I go there, or any of you, there is lots of opposition. And as soon as people have a revelation by the Holy Spirit of who Jesus is, it's suddenly you become an ambassador between opposing people groups, opposing nations. It's never through simple compromise, everybody, for that would be manipulation, wouldn't it? It's through wisdom and discernment according to the counsel of God. Sometimes we're in a hurry when we're somewhere. Come on, get on with it. Let's do this. Let's do that. Let's make sure these many people, you know, whatever they're doing. I don't ever do that anymore. I really don't. Because it's up to God who he wants to touch and what he's doing. I pray into that. But I don't rush anymore because I know if I rush something, I'm trying to manipulate him. Not doing it. I'd rather three people get saved and they get wrecked and take the word out to the world than 3,000 if I try to manipulate something. Do you know that even music was created by God in honor? Do you know how instruments honor each other? The rhythm of music is honor. Do you ever think about that? Think about the complexities of this. It's, and, and when the music is discordant, causes you to go crazy, doesn't it? When it's all in harmony, there's this beautiful thing that happens, this, this whole symphony, because that's what heaven sounds like. Music is made from a unified sound, and we become part of that supernatural orchestrated sound from heaven. And we do it right here on earth as we worship the Lord with honor. Your body Every system in your body is designed to honor the other. And when something is out of balance, there is some dishonor there. And I have spoken before, I don't know if it was here, when people have cancer in their bodies, there's actually a sound that their DNA produces that is disharmonic. When your body is healthy, your DNA produces a sound that is harmonic. Dishonor brings disorder, even in the body. John 15, 13, no greater honor do we have than laying our lives down for a friend. But then <laughs> Jesus goes on quickly to say, well, if you love everyone that loves you, what credit is that to you? Wah, wah, wah. Love and forgive and be generous to your enemy. Yikers. I want you to think about the vastness of God in the weeks to come as you will and I will head into an election. I implore you to vote, but I implore you to vote on your values and the principles in the word of God, not a person. This isn't about people. This is about God. And this is about God's order in a disordered America. And so I implore you to vote and I want you to think about the vastness of God. Even, even in architecture and design, there, there's, there's honor, right? Everything is in balance. Everything is in honor. And Romans 1.20 says this, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his external power and divine nature have been clearly seen, if we have eyes to see, right? being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. Last thing, the position that Jesus Christ holds is the highest position of honor of all time. Jesus is the only one to bring order to chaos and to bring everything into balance. I want you to close your eyes. I'm going to read Revelation 4, verses 10 through 11, and I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to help you imagine the great and honorable Jesus in the court of heaven. He is limitless and he is boundless. The 24 elders fell face down before the one seated on the throne and they worshiped the one who lives forever and ever. 
and they surrendered their crowns before the throne singing, you are worthy, our God, our Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. For you created all things, and by your plan they were created and exist. By your plan they were created and exist. Heavenly Father, as we imagine your glory in the heavenly realms, Father, as we imagine your position of honor, Jesus, I pray in this moment, God, that wherever in our lives we are stuck in a place of judgment or pain, where we feel backed in a corner, Lord, these places that have a fear stranglehold on our lives where we have forgotten that you are the highest king. Show us those places right now, Lord. And even online as you're watching, let the Lord minister to you. He is ministering powerfully wherever those obstacles are. Lord, where I have not honored my body or my parents or my marriage or my family, God, where I've not honored my finances or authorities or government or people different from me. So I just invite you to pray really simply with me. Just say, Jesus, I need some help. I do feel back to the corner. So many things are not going the way I would like. But I ask you, Lord, to shake everything that needs to be shaken. I don't want that stuff anymore. I commit to you, Lord, that I am a disciple. Seated in heavenly places with you. That the enemy is afraid of me. But I have nothing to fear. You are with me, Jesus. And I thank you that I lay down the carnal weapons of judgment, slander, manipulation, impatience, anger, frustration, fear, and limitation. And right now, Lord, I pick up the sword you gave me. The word of God sharper than anything. And with your word and by your spirit, God, I will raise up others because the harvest is at my door. Don't let me miss it, Lord. Open my eyes, open my ears. Keep me as the apple of your eye and a person walking in revelation, honor, and victory. Thank you. I love you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. I just invite you to stand right now. Lord, we just give you all the praise. And we thank you as you're renewing our minds that hope is being released and a new level of gratitude in our hearts right now, Father. 
before we invite the team up, what I'd like for you to do one more time is just close your eyes now. I feel, I feel this impression from the Lord, so I'm just going to do it. And nobody's listening to you. I want this to be between you and the Lord. But for all the things that you are grateful for, I would like for you to just say, Lord, I am grateful for, and say all the things that you're grateful for. And I'm going to give you two minutes to do it. Ready, set, tell him. We are a grateful people. And we walk by faith and not by sight. Keep us in this position of gratitude, Holy Spirit. Because when we are filled with gratitude, we are also filled with hope. So I'm going to invite our ministry team, both the Rock ministry team and our Agape team that's here to come down front. If you need individual prayer for healing, or you need someone to stand with you and pray with you and encourage you, uh, you need to wear a mask if you come up. Our teams need to wear a mask. So I'm going to release the team to come up front. And uh, I want to say God bless you to all of you. If you have kids, I want to release you to go get your kids after you get prayer. Uh, and for all of you online, the Lord is touching you in your own home. He doesn't need you to come into the building if it's risky for you. Just know that every word of the Lord is true for you. And we bless you in Jesus' name.